When Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners in Mark chapter 2, the Pharisees come to him and they're like, what are you doing? You're defiling yourself by being with these people. You're sharing a table with these people. You're making yourself unholy. And what does Jesus say? It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I came to help sinners. I came to save sinners. I came to rescue sinners. I came to enter into the mess of sinful people's lives and rescue them. And in this particular text of Scripture, there are six points that we're going to make. But I'm only going to get to three of them today. And uh, there's just too much to see. There's too much that I want you to see. There's too much that uh, I, I just don't want to go over it quickly. I want us to be able to just sit and savor the glory of Jesus in this text. So we're going to read John 4, 1 through verse 42. And we're going to look at this whole text of Scripture for two weeks, this week and next week, Lord willing. So John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. When therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey and sitting, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan, therefore, the Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it it was who says to you, who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all this way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming. When neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, 
I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. In the meanwhile, the disciples were requesting him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples therefore were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. And from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's pray. (coughs) Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the Savior of the world. To save anyone and everyone who believes in him. Thank you for sending Jesus to pursue us. To find us. To come to us. To make us alive. Thank you for not giving up on us. Lord, I pray that as we spend the next few minutes in your word together, I pray that you would show us the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I pray that we would see him as we've never seen him before. I pray that we would leave in awe of Jesus I pray that our faith would be stirred, that our love would be deepened, that our wonder would be enriched. I pray that we would love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because of Jesus. I pray that those who have not seen him at all, pray they would see him today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. (coughs) Who did Jesus come to save? Did he come just for Jewish people? Or did he come for Jews and Gentiles? Well, Jews and Gentiles, and that's why we're all here. But which Gentiles did Jesus come for? Did he come for the Republicans or the Democrats? Did Jesus come to save black people and white people, or just one or the other? Did Jesus come to save homosexuals or straight people? Did Jesus come to save transgender people or non-transgender people? Did Jesus come to save legal immigrants or illegal immigrants? Did Jesus come to save the woke or the non-woke? Did Jesus come to save people only like you? Or did he come to save 
anyone and everyone who believes. We love to quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The problem is that the way we act sometimes communicates that we don't really believe that. We believe that God loves the people who are like us, who are part of my tribe, my belief system, my shared convictions, my political viewpoint. And we become entrenched in our positions, dividing from one another and literally hating people who are on the opposite side of any particular argument or opinion or conviction. Those people are the enemy. Those people need to be conquered. Those people need to be put in their place. Those people are crazy, and we need to save our country from them. Do you know people on both sides of the political spectrum say that about the other side? Our country is increasingly polarized by narratives being screamed from the right and the left. You say, Pastor, why are you getting all political? I'm not getting political. But I want you to feel what you should feel when you read this text. We need to hear this passage, beloved. We need to uncross our arms for a few moments and just be washed with the word of God. Because it's possible, and I think very likely, that a tribalism of some kind has leached its way into all of our hearts without even consciously realizing it. And what this passage does is that persuades us to call out to Jesus, to believe in Jesus by revealing six different proofs that he is the savior of anyone and everyone who believes in him. To the one who comes to Jesus, to the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God, they receive life. Whoever they are. From whatever background they come. Now we're only going to get to three of those proofs today. But my hope is that you will see the wonder of Jesus in this text. The people that we tend to hate, the people that we tend to despise because of the things they say and the things they do, even those people Jesus came for. So we need to stop hating for a few moments I mean, listen to what this text is saying. Why? Because Jesus is the Savior of the world. Look at verse 42. I think this sums up all that he is trying to tell us. When the Samaritans believed because of the word, notice what they say. We know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the Savior of the world. It's not just the Savior of the Jewish people. It's not just the Savior of, of people of your particular tribe. He is the Savior of the world. Say, I'm still uncomfortable with what you have said so far. That's okay. You need to be uncomfortable for a bit to feel the text. And and what I mean by that is to look at this first proof. Jesus had to go through Samaria so that you can believe. Jesus had to go through Samaria so that you can believe. What do you mean by that? As much as you hate and despise the people in our culture who disagree with you on any number of political or cultural issues... That is how much, if not more, the Jewish people and the Samaritan people hated each other. Now, just a quick background so you can understand here, but I want you to see and I want you to feel the shocking nature of this story 
by putting yourself in it. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Now, both of these people came from Jacob. They came as Israelites. But in 722 BC, the northern kingdom, which was the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, they were exiled into Assyria. Many of the Israelites were deported from Israel and taken and scattered to the winds. And the Assyrians brought in people from other nationalities, other ethnicities, other languages, and they made them live in the land of Israel. So they would mix everybody up. And those people intermarried with the Israelites who were still there, and they formed a race of Samaritans. No longer strictly ethnically Jewish. Their religion was twisted and messed up. In 586 BC, a couple of hundred years later, the southern kingdom, Judah, was also exiled to Babylon. But their exile lasted 70 years. And then the Lord took Judah and brought them back into the land of Israel. You can read the story in Ezra and Nehemiah. And when these Israelites come back into the land of Israel to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, the Samaritans who've been living there, who've been worshiping God in a, in a, in a way, but not faithfully, Worshipping ignorantly, they came and they said, hey, can we work with you? Can we help rebuild? And the Jewish people said, no, go away. You are defiled. We don't want anything to do with you. And so for the next 500 years, an animosity continued to grow. It led to a mutual hatred for centuries. In the day of Jesus... A hundred years before Jesus arrived, the Samaritans had built a temple on Mount Gerizim. And that was the place that they believed that you should worship God. Because they did not, they did not accept anything as Scripture except the first five books of the Old Testament. They believed those were the Word of God. Not the prophets, not the Psalms, not any of that. It was just the, the first five books of Moses. And in that book, you don't, you don't read anything about Jerusalem. But Mount Gerizim is... is Front and center is a place where God interacted with Israel. And so they believed that was the proper place of worship. The Jewish people, from the scriptures that they had received, understood that Jerusalem was the place that the temple was to be built. And the Jewish people came and destroyed the temple at Mount Gerizim, adding further hostilities between these two groups of people. But now, underneath the Roman domination, both of these groups are having to function alongside one another, and there is a simmering hatred. Now, Israel, the Jewish people, they lived in the southern part of the country. Then the, right above them in the north of them is Samaria. And then above that group is the Galilee area. That's where more Jewish people live. So Samaritans were kind of sandwiched between the Jewish people. So anyone from Galilee wanting to worship in Jerusalem had to go through Samaria. But a lot of them wouldn't even do that. They would cross over the Jordan River, travel south on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and then cross back over into Israel just to avoid Samaritans. And if that, doesn't, if, if that doesn't communicate it enough, Peter and John, or not Peter and John, uh, James and John, one time asked Jesus if they could call fire down from heaven to consume a city of Samaritans. That's how much they hated him. That is in this text that we come to this particular moment. Jesus' ministry is beginning to be noticed by the Pharisees. And so in order to avoid conflict and controversy at this early stage of ministry, Jesus goes back to Galilee. But the text says that he had to pass through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. Now this having to go through Samaria, what does that mean? I don't think it means that there was no other route. There was plenty of routes. I don't think it means that this was uh, the only option. I think it's the option Jesus chose for a particular reason. Amen. It's very intentional. It's revealing and explaining to his disciples that he is indeed the Savior of the world. He has come, don't forget, as the Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sin of who? The world. They've learned that in chapter 1, verse 29, Jesus then comes to Jerusalem and he judges the temple, cleansing the temple because they have perverted the temple. And then he declares, this building is no longer the place you access God. No, he is the temple of the living God. 
Then Nicodemus, this esteemed Jewish teacher, comes to Jesus in John chapter 3, and he begins to try and understand what is Jesus saying. And Jesus says, look, you won't even see the kingdom of God. You won't even enter the kingdom of God unless you become transformed into a new person. Being Jewish is not enough. Being Jewish is not an automatic entry card into the kingdom of God. You must come to me. You must believe in me. You must trust in me. I am the gateway. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the temple. I am the place of forgiveness. I am the place of sacrifice. I am the place of worship. I am the way to God. The very gateway from heaven to earth, as Jesus talked about in chapter 1. And as we come into chapter, the end of chapter 3, Jesus speaks this, these glorious words that he's going to be lifted up so that everyone who looks on him will live. Anyone and everyone who looks upon Jesus and sees him as the Son of God and goes to him as the Son of God will have life. And here's the point. Jesus, I think, goes to Samaria to teach his disciples, to teach us. I'm the savior of the world. I'm the savior even of your enemies. I'm the savior of the people that you hate. I'm the savior not just of your tribe, but of their tribe and their tribe and their tribe. He didn't just come for one skin color or one political party or one set of ethical convictions. He came to save sinners of this world. That means that anyone and everyone who believes in Jesus, who calls upon Jesus, who recognizes and submits to him as the Son of God, will be saved. Do you feel that? I hope that you feel that. It's not just about the people who are like me. Jesus came for anyone and everyone who believes. Secondly, Jesus pursues sinners who would never pursue him. And he did that and he does that so that you can believe. And perhaps you think your sin is too far gone. And perhaps you're sitting here and you're feeling like you say anyone and everyone, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know the things that I have done. You don't know what I've said in my heart. You don't know what I've felt towards God in my heart. You don't know how angry I've been. You don't know how immoral I've been. You don't know how wicked my life has been. (laughs) Or maybe that's not what you're thinking. Maybe you're thinking is, Pastor, how can you say this? These people deserve God's judgment. People who kill babies. These people who are so sexually immoral and they're trying to exploit children. These people who enrich and empower themselves. They've got to be beyond saving. They deserve God's judgment. And frankly, you're sitting there like Jonah with your arms crossed waiting for the torch from heaven to fall. But what Jesus does is amazing. Jesus pursues people who would never pursue him. He stops in the middle of the day at the well of of Jacob. This is like noon, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the middle of the day. It's hot. He's been walking all morning. He doesn't have anything to eat. That's why the disciples are going into town to buy food. Probably they've drank the last of their water, and so it's a godsend that they came to the well. And the disciples head into town to purchase food. And while they're gone, this lone woman comes from the city. She comes by herself. Most likely she's carrying a stick, and on either end of that stick is either a leather bag to carry the water in or pots to carry the water in. And she comes to get her daily ration of water carry it back to town as she approaches she sees Jesus and she can tell he's a Jewish man 
And my guess is there's even some hostility in her own heart. I think this woman is probably embittered. She's probably angry that she has to come in the middle of the day. Why does she have to come in the middle of the day? If you look down at verses 17 and 18, Jesus exposes the sin of this woman to, to view. Now, maybe she's been widowed one or two times. Likely she's been divorced a few times, but she's had five different husbands, and the guy she's living with at the moment is not her husband, so she's living in an ongoing sexually immoral relationship. And the fact that she's coming in the heat of the day, not in the early morning and not in the evening, tells us that she's probably not welcome among the other women in the community. She has to go by herself. She's an outcast. She's despised. She's got a scarlet letter written on her back. My guess is she is rejected. She's alone and probably embittered. And she's not interested in talking to a Jew at all. And she doesn't go to Jesus. My guess is she doesn't look at him. She doesn't talk to him. She doesn't say anything to him. She just goes up to the well and she starts to draw the water. It's a very interesting story because in this story there's a contrast between Jesus or not between between how Jesus interacts with this lady and how he interacts with Nicodemus. I think we're meant to see these two stories and these two conversations side by side. Nicodemus, a devout religious man, seeks out Jesus at night and leaves confused and unbelieving. This woman doesn't seek Jesus out. Jesus seeks her out and she leaves believing and evangelizing. Jesus pursues this woman. Jesus initiates conversation with this woman. Jesus starts the conversation, hey, give me a drink. He doesn't give up until this woman believes. Why? Because Jesus is the one who came to seek and to save those who were lost. He came to look for and find and save the lost. That's his whole M.O. in this life. When Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners in Mark chapter 2, the Pharisees come to him and they're like, what are you doing? You're defiling yourself by being with these people. You're sharing a table with these people. You're making yourself unholy. And what does Jesus say? It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I came to help sinners. I came to save sinners. I came to rescue sinners. I came to enter into the mess of sinful people's lives and rescue them. Amen. That's what he came to do. So he comes to this woman to save her. To do the work the Father sent him to do. In fact, when he finishes the conversation, notice she leaves the water pots. I think it's a signal she has received the life water of Jesus. She see, received the living water of Christ. She no longer needs this water. She runs back to town to tell everyone what has happened. And Jesus, my guess, is smiling from ear to ear. And the disciples are like, here's some food. And he's like, I, I don't need it. I've got food you don't even know about. And they're like, wait, somebody give him food. And Jesus says, look, guys. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's my food. That's what satisfies me. That's what gets me going. It's the same truth you see in John 6, verse 35. Look at what he says here. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you, you, that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I, listen to this, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What is that will? This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. The will of God is that anyone and everyone who sees Jesus and believes 
him to be the son of God will have life and will be raised up by Jesus on the last day. And Jesus said, I've come to save them all. All that the Father has given to me, I will save them. And I won't lose any of them. That's the will of my Father. This woman was one of those people. He went there. He had to go there because he was seeking and pursuing a sinner who needed saving. And he reveals himself to this sinner so that she can believe. We'll talk more about that later. But what I want you to understand is that Jesus comes for her. And he's coming for you. He's coming for you, my friend. You are not too far gone for Jesus to save. You are not some hopeless case. The ceiling of this building is not going to fall in when you walk through these doors. You know how many times I've heard that? The fact that these words are stirring your heart right now is evidence that Jesus is pursuing you right now. You fear that he will not accept you because you've lived your whole life in rebellion. You fear that he will not accept you because you're living in rebellion right now. You fear that he will not love you, that he will not want you because your life is an absolute mess and, and you're going you're gonna to leave here and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to go get things figured out. I'm going to go straighten things up. I'm going to go clean myself up so that I am presentable to Jesus. That's not how it works. You can't clean yourself up. You're like an infant trying to change his own diaper. It doesn't work. It makes the situation worse. You need Jesus. And the good and glorious news in this text is that Jesus comes for you. Amen. He pursues you. He's looking for you. We're crouched in the corner, covered in our own filth, biting the hands that try to help us, and Jesus walks into that mess and embraces us and lifts us up and carries us out into the light of glory. Don't you see? You are not unique in your failure to seek God. We all have this problem. The Scripture says in Romans 3, look at Romans 3 with me for just a moment. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. There is none who are righteous. There is none who even seeks God. There is none who does good. Not, not even one. Not a single one of us does good we don't seek God we are dead in sin indulging the desires of our flesh and of our mind we are slaves of sin slaves to the desires of our own flesh this is why Jesus says in John 6 verse 44 no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day do you hear what he's saying no one can come to me. He doesn't say no one will come to me. He says no one can. No one is able. No one is capable of coming to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Unless the Father comes to us and awakens us and strips off our blind eyes and shows us Jesus, we won't come because we can't come. Without the loving, gracious pursuit of Jesus, none of us would be sitting in this room this morning. Without the pursuit of Jesus, none of us would have believed in Jesus. None of us would be worshiping Jesus. Would Lazarus have come out of that tomb if Jesus had not pursued him? Would that little girl have come to life if Jesus had not entered into her room and taken her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, little girl, I say to you, arise. No, because they were dead. You and I are dead. And we can't come unless he comes for us. And praise be to God, Jesus pursues sinners. Even in this moment, 
He's opening your eyes. He's opening your eyes so that you can see the glory of his son. You and I are like this woman. Left to ourselves, we would continue making a mess of our lives. But Jesus has come and Jesus pursues sinners. He's coming for you. But it it gets better. It just keeps getting better. Because not only did Jesus have to go to Samaria so that we would believe, not only does Jesus pursue sinners who don't pursue him so that we can believe, Jesus offers eternal life to whoever asks him for it. Whoever asks him for it, he will give it. Look at what he says in verses 10 through 14. So he's, he's conversing with this lady, and he says to her, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, this whole conversation would be different because you would be asking me for living water, and I would give it. That really should make you more excited than you seem. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew what it was that I had to give to you right now, if you knew what I had to give, and you knew who I was, and I had the ability to give it, and the power to give it, you knew that, you could just ask me, and I would give it. That's all you have to do. You just ask me, and it's yours. If you knew who I was, and you knew what I was giving, all you had to do was ask, and sister, it's yours. That's what he's saying. Jesus answers her, and he urges her to just ask. He's urging you to ask. But she didn't ask because she didn't recognize Jesus. She doesn't know who he is. She doesn't know why he's significant. She doesn't know what he provides. Her failure to ask is due to a lack of understanding, a lack of revelation, a lack of seeing, a lack of light. She doesn't see him in his glory. She doesn't recognize him as the son of God, the savior of the world. She doesn't compute that that's who he is. So she doesn't go to him. Her failure to ask is due to her ignorance of his identity. What's your failure to ask due to? It's the same thing. You don't ask Jesus for life. You don't ask Jesus to satisfy your soul because you don't see him as the son of God. You you see him just like she sees him. She's sitting across the well from him. She's having a conversation with him. She sees him. You and I see him. We've read stories about him. We've heard countless sermons about him. But we don't see him. You see the difference? There's a difference in seeing him and there's a difference in seeing him. You say, Phil, you're using the same word. I know. I'm trying to say it differently. You you see with physical eyes, but you don't yet see with your heart. You don't yet see with True sight. Why? Look at 2 Corinthians 4. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. You've got to see this text. Look at verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. If the good news of Jesus has a curtain in front of it so that you can't see it, it's, it's veiled, it's curtained to those who are perishing. In whose case, he's talking about the perishing here, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. The reason you don't believe, your mind is blinded. The purpose of this blinding, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 
The unbelieving do not see Jesus as the Son of God, the giver of life, because their minds are blinded. And perhaps you don't see right now because your mind is blinded. You're not interested in what I'm talking about because your mind is blinded. But maybe, just maybe, the darkness of your soul has cracked. And the shaft of light is now piercing through that curtain. And you're starting to wonder if all this is true. You're starting to hope in your heart that what I'm talking about is real. What's happening? Look at what he says in verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Paul says, so we preach Jesus. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm preaching Jesus. I'm setting Jesus before you. I'm lifting up Jesus so you can see him. But it, like I said last week, it's not about me. I can't do it for you. All I can do is set Jesus in front of you, but God has to do something in your heart. And if you're starting to see Jesus, it's because God is doing something in your heart right now. Look at what it says in verse 6. For God said, for God who said, light shall shine out of the darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In the same way God said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. God says, let there be light in your dead heart, and you see Jesus. You see the glory of Jesus. And what I mean is, you see the face of God in Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. You recognize him as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and suddenly all other things in this life, all other pursuits in this life, all other desires in this life, they just, they just fade into the background of reality because you don't even care about them anymore. You are enraptured with Jesus. That's what it's to see him. She didn't see him because her heart was blind. She didn't recognize him. Oh God, open our eyes, please. Do you see him? Do you see him? We are dead and dying without Jesus. He is the Son of God, the very image of God, the visible manifestation of God, God in human flesh, the fullness of deity dwells in Him in bodily form. He is God whom we can see. Do you see Him? But the woman failed to ask because she didn't recognize Him, but she also didn't ask because she had no idea what He was talking about. She didn't know the gift that he gives. She failed to ask Jesus for a drink because she didn't understand what he offered. If she knew what he was offering, if she knew what he was providing, then she would have asked because Jesus is offering living water. Look at what he says. She's confused in verses 11 and 12. She's like, okay, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? I mean, is there another well? Is there a creek somewhere nearby? What, what are you talking about? Where are you getting this water? You don't even have anything to draw with. Look at what Jesus says in verse 13. Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. What is Jesus saying? This metaphor of, love, of water is talking about the Holy Spirit and eternal life. The water that Jesus gives is the Spirit of God who gives and enlivens us with eternal life. Jesus says, look, if you drink of this water, what happens? You get thirsty and you have to drink again. You come here every single day to get water because if you don't drink water, you die of thirst in a few days. Your thirst 
is a mechanism that says, warning, warning, you're dying. Replenish the stores or you will die. That's what thirst means. But Jesus says, you, you drink this water and it keeps you alive, but you got to keep drinking it because it doesn't actually give you life. It just holds off death. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a difference in giving you life and holding off death. Jesus said, if you drink the water that I give you, you will never thirst. What? The water that I give you makes you alive. You're no longer mortal. You're you're no longer subject to death. You wait a minute. We all know people who love Jesus and died. Go to John 11. Go to John 11. <coughs> Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Do you understand? If you believe in Jesus, you live even if you die. Physical death is not death, ultimately. And even that is reversed, the resurrection. But Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, you live even if you die. What he's saying is what Paul is saying in Philippians 1. For me to, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. How in the world can death be gained? Because in death, we are simply ushered into the uninterrupted, unmediated presence of Jesus. We see Him in all of His glory with our eyes. We walk into paradise with the King of glory awaiting the day when He makes all things new and resurrects our body. What happens when you believe in Jesus is that he infuses you with eternal life. You have eternal life, which means that even if your physical body expires, you don't stop living. You live on with Jesus in paradise until he resurrects you. Thank you, brother. And makes you new. It's like... It's like your computer. Your computer is a wonderful little gadget that you can unplug and you can go anywhere and you can type and all this stuff. But what happens at some point is the little red light starts flashing and it says, if you do not plug your computer in, it will die. The little warning light is the thirst mechanism. But if, you live, if your computer is plugged into the power source, that warning light never comes on. Why? Because there's an unlimited source of power that's always there. When we trust in Christ, when he gives us eternal life, he gives us himself by giving us the Holy Spirit who resides in us, who becomes the never exhaustible life force, so to speak. That sounds very new agey. I don't like that. Not life force. He gives us eternal, unending, unconquerable, undying life. This is why he says you'll never thirst again. It's like the Old Testament sacrifices. They brought these animals in and they sacrificed the animals over and over and over and over. Why? Because the animals didn't actually take their sins away. But Jesus comes... In Hebrews chapter 9, it tells us that he comes once for all to put away sin once by the sacrifice of himself. He did it. He gives permanent redemption, permanent forgiveness, permanent life to all who believe in him, to those who ask him. This is the water that he gives, eternal life. Look at John chapter 7, verse 37. Look at John chapter 7, verse 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Drink of me, drink of the water that I'm giving you. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Holy of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. 
For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. This living water that gives life that never ends is the Spirit of God. And Jesus says, this is something that you've heard about in the Scriptures. Look, look, look with me at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 17. You have to see this. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. O Yahweh, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water, even Yahweh. Yahweh is the fountain of living water. Jesus is Yahweh, the fountain of living water. He gives living water. What is this living water? Look at Ezekiel chapter 47. Look at Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. You should go home and read this text because I'm not going to read all of it. But it is describing prophetically this eschatological temple, right? At the end of days when God is making all things new, he's talking about this temple of God. And out of the temple flows a river. And this river flowing out of the temple goes into the land and makes it flourish. It brings about life where there was only death. Everything becomes fresh. So everything will live where the river goes, he says in verse 9. This river flowing out of the temple. What is he talking about? Now, go to Revelation. Go to Revelation, because we know uh, in chapter, uh, let's see, chapter, uh, chapter, there's so many. Let's go to chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We know in John 2 that Jesus declared himself to be the temple of God, right? Now, you see all of this coming together in Revelation 21. Look at verse 22. And, I, and he's talking about New Jerusalem. He's talking about the, 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 the end of all things. New Jerusalem, which is also the bride, which is the people of God. He says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of a sun or moon or to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed, and they shall, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are in the, written in the Lamb's book of life. So you see, in this, this eschatological existence, New Jerusalem, heaven, if you will, where we dwell with God, there is no temple because the Lamb and God the Father are the temple. You see the first two members of the Trinity there. Now look at chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. So it's coming from what? The temple. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit of every kind every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his bondservants shall serve him and they shall see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall no longer be any night. There shall no longer be need of a lamp or a light or the light of the sun because the Lord God shall illumine them and they shall reign forever and ever. The river is the Spirit. All three members of the Trinity here in communion with the people of God and out of God flows the Spirit who gives eternal life. This is what Jesus is talking about in John 4. If you knew what I had to give you, you would just ask me and I would give you the water of life, the Spirit of God who gives eternal life life you didn't ask because you didn't know who I was you didn't ask because you didn't know what I had to give but now you know who he is and now you know what he gives the glory in this is he offers it to anyone and everyone who asks of him if she would ask 
he would have given it. Period. If she asked, he would have given it. If you ask, he will give him to you. If you ask, the Lord will give you the Spirit and give you life. You and I are, are thirsty. We're always looking for soul satisfaction. For that which gives us peace and joy and hope and confidence over fear. But nothing satisfies. We turn to the idols of this world. We turn to the gods of this world. We turn to money and fame and reputation and sex and pleasure and entertainment. We turn to relationships and parenting and husbands and wives. We, we turn to everything and anything in hopes that that will make us fulfilled, that that will slake the thirst of our heart. But Jesus said, come to me. Just like the passage in Isaiah 55, are you thirsty? Then come and drink of the water of life. Jesus is pursuing sinners today. Seek him while he is near. Call upon him while he is close at hand. Is your heart gripped with the conviction of what I'm telling you? You know it's true. You simply, you just see now what you didn't see before. Then call out to him and ask him to save you. He will save you. Follow him. Pledge yourself to him in baptism and say, yes, Lord, you are God and I am not. I will follow you all the days of my life. Call out to Jesus and he will save you. Come to Jesus. Ask of Jesus. As we sing this song of response, it's time for you to respond. Some of you need to be saved. You need to ask Jesus to save you. You can come to the front and do that. You can sit down in your chair and do it where you're at. But you need to come to Jesus. Some of us are in Jesus. But we've allowed the world to, to cloud our eyes to where we've not been seeing the glory and goodness of Jesus and we've been starting to chase other things when we need to come back to Jesus. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes, take the water of life without cost. These are the words of Jesus at the end of the Bible. Are you thirsty? Come. It doesn't cost. You just have to ask. And he gives. For added insight to today's teaching, we invite you to check out the following podcast on Spotify, Apple, or Amazon Music. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll tune in again next week.